Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you. I apologize for the late start of the briefing. I wanted to give you all an opportunity to see the end of the spirited conversation that the president uh, participated in at, uh, in Georgetown. I suspect we'll have the opportunity to discuss that a little bit more here. Uh, before we do, however, I want to uh, commend to your attention a statement that was issued earlier today by uh, Bernadette Meehan, who is the spokesperson for the National Security Council. Uh, she issued a statement today that uh, it's with a heavy heart that earlier this week we marked American journalist Austin Tice's 1,000th day in captivity. Uh, I won't reread re her entire statement, but obviously our thoughts and prayers are not just with Austin today, uh, but they're also with uh, his parents, Deborah and Mark, uh, and his brothers and sisters who uh, are missing him dearly. Uh, the United States government, working closely with our Czech protecting power in Syria, uh, is trying to uh, bring him home. And uh, that is an effort that is ongoing and has been for some time, uh, and certainly something that we are uh, very focused on every day. But today we're particularly mindful of um, this week being uh, his 1,000th day in captivity. So. Uh, on that somber note, Jim, let's uh, move to your questions. Uh, thanks, Jim. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, trade and this uh, procedural vote that's uh, going to take place this afternoon in the Senate. Uh, we're already hearing some pro-trade Democrats kind of lowball expectations on, on that vote. I believe uh, standing Hoyer in the House said that uh, if that if the 60 votes don't materialize, it's not the end of the story. I'm wondering. How much of a setback is it for the president to lose uh, this vote today if that were to happen? Uh, is it, is, does it, are there other opportunities ahead, or is this a, an uphill climb or a worse climb now? Well, Jim, the thing that we have been very clear about from the very beginning uh, is that the president was seeking from the United States Congress the authority necessary to complete uh, the TPP agreement and the authority that's necessary to enforce it. And we were gratified earlier this spring when the Senate Finance Committee acted in bipartisan fashion uh, to produce legislation that would do exactly that. Uh, not only was that legislation uh, supported uh, by both Democrats and Republicans on the committee, it was supported by a majority of Republicans and a majority of Democrats on the committee. Uh, and that is a testament to uh, the commitment to bipartisanship that's been on display in the Senate uh, in the Finance Committee in particular. Now, uh, what's also true is that it is not unprecedented, to say the least, for the United States Senate to encounter procedural snafus. Uh, that was true when Democrats were in charge of the United States Senate. Uh, we've talked before about how that's been true when, uh, when Republicans have been in charge of the United States Senate. Uh, and what we're hopeful uh, is that uh, every member of the United States Senate can summon the bipartisan spirit that was on display in the Senate Finance Committee uh, to work through uh, this procedural snafu. And the good news is that we have seen uh, statements in public already today from people like Leader McConnell, from Senator Wyden, uh, even Senator Hatch, who obviously was instrumental to crafting this bipartisan compromise, to a willingness to work in bipartisan fashion to um, untangle uh, this procedural knot that the Senate right now is uh, mired in. So uh, we're obviously going to continue to remain engaged with members of the United States Senate. But the truth is, most of our discussions are focused uh, on the substance. Uh, and you know, the Senate has a process for working through these procedural challenges. And we're pleased to see Democrats and Republicans uh, both indicating a willingness to work through these procedural challenges. It seems one of the main challenges right now is deciding uh, which aspects of trade and trade-related bills get dealt with. Does the President have a, a view on whether there's a particularly a, a, a bill on customs provisions that includes a, a currency, currency language that the White House is not thrilled with but would have certainly did not want it in the, uh, in the trade <coughs> uh, promotion authority bill. It ended up in this customs bill. Does the President want that to proceed? Would the President prefer that just uh, two bills, as uh, McConnell has proposed, to move through the, the process? Well, Jim, what we've been clear about is the President needs both the authority to complete the TPP deal as well as the authority necessary to enforce it. And there are obviously 
strongly held views in the Senate that many times cross partisan lines uh, about the wisdom of the way in which the legislation is written uh, and advanced through the Senate. So these are procedural challenges that, uh, that members of the Senate will have to work through. Uh, and you know, uh, the, the President of the United States and members of his staff will continue to remain engaged uh, in having conversations with members of the Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, about the substance of this proposal. And we're going to continue to uh, work through uh, these challenges with them. Procedural challenges ultimately determine the fate of legislation, however, and I'm wondering, given the effort that the President has put into this, what does it say about, about those efforts if right now, on the verge, on the eve, on the verge of, this, of this vote, we still don't know which way it's going to come out? Well, Jim, I just would observe that these kinds of procedural snafus have cropped up even when we're talking about otherwise pretty simple and straightforward pieces of legislation. And the legislation that currently is, um, that has been passed through the Senate Finance Committee uh, is anything but simple and straightforward. Uh, I think anybody would acknowledge this is complicated. Uh, but the President believes that it doesn't give him the authority that's necessary to uh, complete the deal uh, and to enforce it. And that's why he has uh, been strongly encouraging Democrats uh, to support it. Uh, but that's different from the kind of procedural snafu that currently is facing the United States Senate. Uh, so they're going to have to you know, work through this challenge, and we'll remain engaged with them as they do. Okay. Roberta. So a group of uh, pro-trade senators are saying they're not going to support today's vote unless the four bills are packaged together. What is the White House position on packaging those four bills together? Do you agree with them, or would you rather they just do the one thing, or what are you saying? Uh, well, the case that we have made to uh, both Democrats and Republicans, but principally Democrats, uh, is that the authority that's vested in this legislation uh, is critically important to the future of our economy. And so we have made a, uh, a case, both publicly and privately, about the importance of the Senate acting in bipartisan fashion to get this done. And we were gratified that we saw that kind of bipartisanship in the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, and it's going to be incumbent uh, upon Democrats and Republicans in the Senate uh, to work together to figure out how to overcome this procedural snafu uh, and advance legislation that, as we saw in the Finance Committee, has clear bipartisan support in the Senate. So you're not going to take a position on how that snafu, as you call it, should be worked through? Yeah. Well, as, when it comes to these procedural things, uh, you know, we've often uh, made clear that it's the responsibility of the, of the Senate to work through them. Uh, we're going to continue to remain engaged and have conversations with members of the Senate as they do exactly that. But ultimately, this will be a responsibility of uh, members of the Senate to, to work through. Uh, the one, one other thing that I will say is, uh, and again, I've said this about legislation that's far less complicated than this one, which is that we live in an era of divided government, where there are Republicans who are in charge of both houses of, of the Congress. There's a Democrat that's sitting in the Oval Office. There is a Republican majority in the Senate, but it's not a filibuster-proof majority, which means that for anything to become law, party line votes are not going to cut it. And that's why uh, you know, we're going to continue to urge members of the Congress to act in bipartisan fashion. We've seen that kind of bipartisan spirit uh, on display in the Senate Finance Committee, and it yielded a good result. Uh, and we're hopeful that as the Senate works through, these, uh, through this particular procedural snafu, uh, that they will encounter the kind of bipartisan compromise uh, that will be required to advance any legislation. Well, on our topic, um, Iranian warships are traveling with a cargo ship that is uh, bound for Yemen, and Tehran says that the cargo ship is carrying aid. Um, what's the U.S. response to this, and will the U.S. presence in that region um, make an effort to stop Iran from moving this, um, letting this ship go directly to Yemen? Roberta, I can tell you that the United States is monitoring uh, this latest maritime shipment from Iran to Yemen. What we expect is that the humanitarian assistance that Iran uh, is willing to offer will be, uh, will occur uh, through the process that's already established by the United Nations. Now what the United Nations has done is they've established essentially a, 
uh, a relief effort uh, inside of Djibouti, uh, where humanitarian aid can be offloaded in Djibouti. It can be processed by UN experts uh, and effectively and efficiently distributed to those who are most in need in Yemen. Uh, this has the effect of ensuring that, for example, uh, there's no accusation of, of political preference being demonstrated by who, um, who receives the aid. Uh, we can also make sure that the aid that's needed in some parts of the country gets to the right places. In some places, a priority is going to be placed on medical supplies. In some cases, there'll be a priority placed uh, on food. Uh, in other cases, there may be a priority placed on fuel. Uh, this is basically uh, an effort to try to be responsive to the needs of the local populations. And there are uh, officials at the United Nations that have an expertise uh, in this area. The thing that's also important uh, is that using this, essentially a logistics hub in Djibouti, will allow for the enforcement uh, of United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216, which put in place an arms embargo against uh, the Houthi rebels. Uh, and so by allowing the UN to process those humanitarian donations uh, and to efficiently distribute them, uh, we'll make sure that uh, we're uh, enforcing the arms embargo, uh, while at the same time most efficiently and effectively delivering assistance to those who are most in need. So will the U.S. ensure that that ship does not go direct and instead goes to Djibouti or wherever? Well, it's my understanding that the the journey uh, of this particular maritime vessel has only recently begun from Iran, uh, and we're monitoring uh, the, the shipment. And again, we would urge uh, Iran to utilize this relief hub that's been established uh, in Djibouti. I mean, the other thing that I'll, the la I guess the last thing I'll point out on this is that the Iran understands that they can't afford to play games with humanitarian assistance to people who are in dire need, uh, like we see in Yemen. Uh, and the Iranians know as well as anyone uh, that a political stunt uh, to defy their regional rivals outside the UN system uh, is provocative and risks a collapse of the UN-led humanitarian ceasefire that's scheduled to go in place later today. Okay, Mara. Just back to pray for a minute. You, you seem to kind of dismiss what's happening in the Senate as just a procedural snafu. Um, assuming it gets solved, do you feel confident you have the votes? in both houses to pass fast track? Well, the, what is true, and I think uh, Senator Wyden himself, uh, through one form or another, made clear that the concerns they have about the current procedural problem in the United States Senate has not in any way affected his overall support for the legislation that advanced through the Senate Finance Committee. Or Democrats overall support? Uh, his overall support. Oh, okay. And I think that the point is, I think as other Democrats talk about this, I think that you'll find other Democrats uh, who are saying the same thing. So you're confident. Well, what I'm confident is that the, uh, that a no vote on this procedural situation should not be interpreted as a change in position uh, on the substance of the bill. Uh, and again, I, I don't speak for these senators, so you should go ask them. But Senator Wyden, I know, is one person who has made clear that's his view. I suspect that there are uh, a number of others. I say that based on the fact that there were seven Democrats uh, who voted this particular legislation out of the Senate Finance Committee. And that, I think, is an indication uh, that there is present already uh, Democratic support for this legislation and the potential uh, that uh, even more Democrats uh, could support the legislation as uh, if and when it makes its way to the floor. Is the president frustrated that Hillary Clinton hasn't um, said anything in support of this? Uh, not particularly. Uh, she's not a member of the United States Senate. I think if she weren't a member of the United, if she were a United, member of the United States Senate, then uh, then we might. Uh, but in this case, you know, she's uh, she's got a campaign to run, and I think what she what she has indicated uh, is consistent with what the president has said uh, about this in terms of the uh, goal of the TPP negotiations, which is to open up uh, opportunity for American businesses overseas uh, in a way that we can ensure benefits middle class families across the country. The President obviously shares those values and shares that goal. Okay. Richard. Thank you, Josh. Uh, two questions. First one, uh, Russia. Is the uh, sec uh, is Secretary Kerry bringing a message, a personal message from the President to uh, President Putin? 
Uh, I don't know that there's a personal message uh, that the Secretary of State is bringing with him, is taking with him to Russia. Uh, but obviously there are a range of issues that will be discussed by the Secretary of State and both his Russian counterpart and President Putin. Uh, as I, shortly before I walked out here, I was informed that the, the meeting with President Putin had just begun. Uh, so there are a range of issues for us to talk about, everything from uh, uh, obviously the situation in Syria to uh, the ongoing negotiations with Iran. Uh, Russia has played a key part uh, in those talks as a member of the P5 plus one. Uh, and we're certainly going to spend a lot of time talking about the situation in Ukraine and the need for uh, Russia uh, and the separatists that they back in eastern Ukraine to live up to the terms of the Minsk implementation plan. Uh, so far, we haven't seen that. Uh, but living up to those commitments will be uh, in a critical part of de-escalating the conflict that we see in Ukraine right now. Is it conceivable that the relationship will go ahead even if nothing really changes on the Ukrainian front? Well, as we've talked about a number of times in this room, the, the United States ha has uh, a complicated relationship with Russia, that there are some very vigorous disagreements we have on a number of issues. Uh, the most prominent of them is Ukraine. It's certainly not the only one. But there are a wide range of other areas where the United States and Russia have been able to work effectively together to advance the interests of citizens in both our countries. And everything, you know, this is indicative, or and this is true of the space program, uh, where obviously uh, Russian scientists and astronauts have worked uh, closely and effectively with uh, American scientists and astronauts uh, to explore outer space. Uh, this has also been true of uh, ridding Syria of their declared chemical weapons stockpile. Uh, that that would not have occurred without the effective coordination and cooperation uh, of the United States and Russia to round up that declared chemical weapons stockpile and dispose of it. Uh, in a way that um, would prevent the proliferation of those specific materials that would, if proliferated, pose a pretty serious threat uh, to our interests and to our people. So maybe simplistic, but uh, I, you say often complicated relationship, but uh, would you say it's still a constructive relationship? Uh, there's no question that we have been able to use elements of our relationship to advance the national security interests of the United States. The national security interests of the United States was enhanced uh, with the destruction of Syria's declared chemical weapons stockpile. Uh, the national security interest of the United States is advanced uh, if we can capitalize on this diplomatic opportunity to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Again, that will require the cooperation and support uh, of Russian negotiators. And thus far, that's exactly what we've received in a way that's good for the United States. It also happens to be good for the people of Russia. Uh, and so I think that is an indication that we can work effectively together um, despite the significant disagreements we have uh, about the way that Russia has handled their business uh, when it comes to their relationship with Ukraine. The last question, totally different topic, sorry, the, the, the Brady story, uh, Tom Brady story. Uh, I, I just want to know... People in Canada are following this closely? Yes, very closely actually, and not okay. only the, the people in general, but also the kids are following American football a lot. And yeah. I would like, would like to know, how the, does the White House see, like, prominent players like this, should they be a role model, aren't they a role model for kids? And by extension, shouldn't, be, shouldn't they follow a higher standards of overall behavior? Well, there has been a lot of discussion. <laughs> I, I will say that I, that I spent a lot of time thinking about all the things that were going to come up in this briefing. Um, uh, and there are a number of them we'll get to. This is one of them, actually. Uh, I will just say that as a, as a general matter, I've not spoken to the President about this particular issue. Um, uh, and I haven't thought uh, nearly as much about this uh, issue as um, obviously uh, executives at the NFL have um, and as many NFL fans, and particularly Patriots fans, have. Um, I will say, just as a general matter, that I do think that um, people around the world, particularly children, particularly boys, uh, do look up to Tom Brady. Uh, he is somebody who has a reputation for professionalism. He's somebody who has enjoyed tremendous success uh, on the football field uh, and has carried himself off the field in a way that uh, has earned the respect of a lot of people. Uh, and I think that as he uh, confronts this particular situation and he determines what the next steps will be for him, that he'll be mindful uh, of the way that he serves to be, um, the way he serves as a role model uh, to so many, not just American kids, as you point out, but to kids around the world. Okay. Andrew. Right. 
Um, Raul Castro said today that uh, Cuba and the U.S. could exchange ambassadors as soon as May the 29th, I think you said. Um, does that fit your expected time frame? I mean, could we see a reestablishment of diplomatic relations within weeks? Well, I know that there are additional uh, conversations that are planned uh, between now and the end of May. Uh, and, you know, our uh, efforts to work with Cuba to start to normalize uh, the relations between our two countries uh, is something that we continue to pursue. The President had the opportunity to visit with President Castro in Panama uh, a few weeks ago, and that certainly uh, continued to advance this effort uh, toward norm normalization. Uh, they also had an opportunity to have a, a, an extended discussion about um, the priority that the United States places on respecting basic universal human rights. Uh, and you know, these are, that is, uh, we have expressed quite often in public and in private the concerns that we have with uh, the Cuban government uh, and the frequency with which they trample the basic universal human rights of their people. Uh, and that's a concern. And the President's view is that uh, after 50 years of a policy that tried to isolate Cuba, that the United States demonstrated very little ability uh, to influence uh, the Cuban government on when it came to basic protections for human rights. Uh, and the President um, feels strongly uh, that by changing our policy, by seeking greater engagement, not just between the Cuban government and the American government, but between the Cuban people and the American people, that we can um, continue to support the Cuban people uh, as they seek the kind of government uh, that respects their rights and allows them to fulfill their ambitions. Uh, so we're going to continue to advance uh, this process, uh, and it's uh, one that this administration takes very seriously, and it's been, uh, it continues to be the source of extensive discussion within the United States government, but also uh, with the Cuban government. President, have an ambassadorial candidate or a short list in mind? Uh, he may, uh, but not one I'm prepared to announce for you. Okay. Margaret. Thank you. Um, I have a TBA question, but first a Tom Brady follow. Okay. Um, uh, so I just wanted to clarify, you said that you hadn't spoken with the President about it yet. Did you mean the issue of whether Tom Brady should be a role model to kids, or do you mean at all? Because we were sort of trying to figure out what he thinks as a sports fan about the punishment, both for Brady and for the team. And also, uh, uh, on a related thread, the idea that the controversy over whether or not he skipped the White House announcement because he was angry about you and the President's team. Well, the um I saw some of those news reports myself. The, uh, I have not spoken to the President since this uh, latest announcement from the NFL, I guess it was just yesterday, about the, uh, the punishment that they'd handed down against the Patriots and against Mr. Brady. Uh, and I have not spoken to the President about uh, Mr. Brady's status as a, as a role model. Uh, I've also not talked to the President about uh, Mr. Brady's decision not to uh, attend the White House celebration of their Super Bowl victory last, uh, earlier this year. Organizations are interested if the President would like to weigh in on what he thinks about. Okay. okay. Well, there may so be an opportunity for you to ask him. Oh, okay. Uh, on uh, TPA, TBP, uh, Patty Murray spotted, as they say, outside with Dennis McDonough um, just before the President left for Georgetown, and I'm wondering uh, what that was about. Was it her coming to give him a heads up? Was it him trying to do a last-minute whip kind of thing? And was there anyone else here? Like, what, what was going down there? What happened? What was that? Well, uh, my understanding is that Senator Murray uh, had a meeting at the White House on an entirely different issue. Um, but as is indicative, I'm Brady. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Given her status as a as a loyal Seahawks fan, I doubt it. Um, uh, but she was here on a on a on a different issue, and I do think that the I am aware that the chief of staff I did want to have a conversation with her while she was here uh, on the you know the current efforts to. Uh, resolve the procedural snafu in the United States Senate. Uh, this is indicative of the kinds of conversations that the President senior White House officials have been having over the last several weeks uh, with members of the Senate in both parties, uh, mostly Democrats, uh, but occasionally uh, a Republican uh, conversation or two. And you know, again, you know, we're, uh, we're going to continue to, uh, to try to nurture this bipartisan agreement. And uh, as members of the, the Senate try to tap into that bipartisan spirit that allowed uh, for the strong support of this legislation at the committee level, uh, hopefully we'll be able to advance on the floor as well. Just so sorry, I was turned. So he he what he grabbed her on the way out because he knew she was here and he didn't want to talk. to uh, her. I don't know if he's on the way out or on the way in. She was here for a different reason, and they did have a a, a brief conversation about. Yeah, that's what 
they were talking about, even though that's not why she was originally coming. Correct. Okay, thanks. Correct. John? Uh, you called this issue with uh, the, the trade bill uh, a snafu? That's correct. <laughs> Once or twice. Procedural <laughs> snafu. Procedural, Procedural snafu. snafu. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Procedural snafu. Remind me, what does what, what snafu stand for? <laughs> this, is a, this is a family program, John. Uh, but the first words are situation normal, I believe, right? Um, but but is, isn't at the core of the problem here that prominent, some of the most prominent uh, figures in the president's party on Capitol Hill are simply not with him on this? It's not just Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders on the left. I mean, it's, uh, you know, he, he hasn't well, had There's prominent figures in their own, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, within the leadership, and, right, and of course, Elizabeth Warren's now a member of the leadership. But um, no, I, I, yeah, I would acknowledge that there are there are a number of Democrats who do not intend to support this legislation. Uh, but what I would also quickly follow up to say is that it's the president's view that there is ample reason for Democrats to support legislation that would give him the authority to complete the TPP negotiations and the authority that's necessary to enforce whatever agreement is reached. Say about the president's power of persuasion within his own party right now, that the, that the most prominent players uh, on Capitol Hill don't agree with him on this, are not convinced by his arguments on this, and the most prominent player outside, Hillary Clinton, won't even step forward to, uh, to make the case or even, you know, say she agrees with the president. I think what I would do, John, is I would urge you to uh, withhold judgment about the president's persuasion ability uh, until we've had an opportunity to. Uh, try to advance this piece of legislation so uh, through the Senate. On this. Uh, I, I, I would, I'm not in the prediction business, particularly when it comes to actions that are taken on Capitol Hill. But I think the President's made clear that he considers this to be a domestic priority, principally because of the positive impact it would have on expanding economic opportunity for American businesses and American workers. Okay, then we're subject to the uh, uh, decision to allow Shell to uh, drill in the Arctic. Um, as you've seen, uh, environmental groups are, are upset by this decision. One, uh, Friends of the Earth, said it is outrageous how our own government appears determined to sacrifice our precious Arctic Ocean for Shell's profits. Uh, what is your response to that, and how do you square this decision to uh, allow more drilling in the Arctic with uh, what the President has said about climate change? Uh, John, this reflects the all, uh, all of the above approach that this administration has taken to our uh, energy security. Uh, and uh, the fact is we have taken steps to open up some regions of the Arctic to um, closely supervised drilling uh, by Shell. Uh, there are some additional permitting steps that need to take place before the, uh, this activity will uh, begin. Uh, but this is something that will be done under the strict oversight of the Department of Interior. Uh, and uh, it will be consistent with the upgraded safety standards that have been put in place in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster. Uh, what's also true is that there are significant areas of the Arctic uh, that have been designated for protection uh, under the leadership of this president. Um, that includes 9.8 million acres uh, in the waters of the uh, Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. Uh, that includes uh, the designation to protect Alaska's Bristol Bay from mining activity. Uh, and you'll recall there was a big hole below when the President uh, re-upped uh, his proposal to permanently protect another national treasure, uh, the Arctic <coughs> National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and you know, that's an indication that we need to have an all-of-the-above approach. What's also a part of this approach is uh, investment in and capitalizing on the opportunity that exists when it, becomes, uh, when it comes to renewable energy. Uh, that's why under the President's watch we've seen that uh, the amount of energy that's generated by the wind has tripled just under uh, the President's uh, tenure as in office. Uh, and we've actually seen that the amount of energy that's produced uh, by solar uh, has in increased 20 times uh, since the President's first day in office. So we've made substantial progress in investing in and capitalizing on the opportunity that exists when it comes to renewable energy. Uh, we've talked at length about the kinds of steps that we have taken when it comes to increasing energy efficiency, both in our cars and trucks, but also in our buildings, uh, in a way that's had positive economic benefits for middle class families across the country, but also had a positive impact on our uh, climate. Uh, but what's also true is the President's committed to ensuring that we are um, doing as much as we can to protect our energy security. Uh, and that means looking for uh, opportunities to safely, uh, uh, you know, uh, develop uh, sources of energy 
uh, on American soil. Uh, and I think this, again, this decision reflects uh, the effort to pursue that all of the above approach. Okay. Uh, Bill. The President today talked at some length about rates for the panel on poverty that he had at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. uh, his remarks seemed deeply personal uh, and at much greater length than we've heard. And on top of this, the First Lady, of course, made some uh, remarks about her experiences with race at her speech at Tuskegee. Is this something that they've set out to do? Is this a change of some sort? Is this a message that they're starting to send? Well, uh, I think that you, what, much of what you've seen from the President, at least over the last couple of weeks, has been re uh, a reflection of uh, the national debate and dialogue uh, that has been taking place across the country uh, when it comes to these issues of uh, the relationship between uh, law enforcement officers and the communities they serve and protect. Uh, there is a, um, obviously, significant overlap when it comes to uh, that issue and the issue of race. Uh, they're not the same thing. but. Uh, to deny that race is an element uh, of some of those challenges uh, is to deny uh, sort of the basic uh, fact of what's going on. Uh, and the President you know, has been asked a number of questions about this, and he's answered them and uh, talking about, spoken about it uh, freely. In previous six years, he's had relatively little to say about race. Well, I don't know. The President gave a pretty prominent speech when he was running for office uh, on this topic, and uh, the President had ample opportunity to weigh in on things like the tragic death of Trayvon Martin. Uh, and other situations where the President has spoken out on these issues, uh, principally because they've been part of a broader national debate. And the President, as the first black President of the United States, I think has something, uh, and he thinks has something important to contribute to that debate. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think what the President was most interested in talking about today was a, a discussion and an examination, and in some cases even a debate, uh, about how to expand economic opportunity in this country for all Americans. Uh, but, you know, at, at different points in the conversation it did. Uh, cause him to reflect more on uh, his own views about how to um, address uh, some of the uh, uh, challenges that we face uh, when it comes to uh, the persistent uh, divisions around race. You also mentioned Austin Tice at the outset. Uh, we believe he's being held by the Syrians, and is there anything particular we're doing to try to obtain his release as opposed to other hostages? Well, uh, we continue to be very focused on trying to uh, rescue and return him. Um, I don't have much I can say in terms of uh, our view about where or by whom he's being held. Um, but I can tell you that we continue to work through our check protecting power in Syria to get information about his welfare and his whereabouts. And we're certainly appreciative of the Czech mission for uh, their efforts on behalf of Austin and effectively on behalf of the American people in trying to secure his safe return. The other thing that's true is the United States has been in periodic direct contact with Syrian government officials, strictly on consular issues, uh, including the case of Austin Tice. Uh, but for privacy and security reasons, uh, I don't have any additional details about that beyond, um, uh, beyond that description of uh, periodic direct contact with gov Syrian government officials. Do you have anything on a helicopter missing in Nepal? Uh, I don't have anything on that, but we can check on it. Okay. Jim. Uh, getting back to the President's remarks uh, at this poverty event, uh, at one point he said there are some communities where I'm not, I don't know, not only do I not know poor people, I don't even know people who have trouble paying the bills at the end of the month, I just don't know these people. Was he trying to say that he is somewhat out of touch? No. <laughs> that, was a, that, that would be a gross misreading of his comments. Okay. That's why I'm uh, asking. That's good. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Uh, I, what the, the President began those comments by noting that what we see in this country is a greater degree of class segregation. Uh, and what that essentially means is, is that, uh, that, that people who are in the upper income brackets uh, live in neighborhoods where they're surrounded by uh, other people uh, who are in the same income bracket uh, and don't come into regular contact with people who may have, um, may have trouble paying the bills on a monthly basis. And the President was articulating his concern that that kind of segregation, class segregation, uh, has, affected our, has affected the policy debate about the best way to address uh, some of these persistent challenges in our society. Uh, and um, I think the President indicated that it was important for all of us to challenge ourselves uh, to sort of step outside of our own comfort zone and to think more broadly about some of these issues. 
And uh, with his comments today and the announcement about the library, uh, it seems to be, uh, I don't know, it, it seems as if he, he's, he's starting to think about his legacy and that uh, his legacy is on his mind. And I know you're going to tell me he's hard at work, you know, trying to get things done for the American people. And well, well, we'll think about legacy every once in a while, but, you know, he's not going to spend a whole lot of time thinking about that. But it, it does seem like he's spending some time thinking about that. Well, uh, uh, Jim, the principal reason that the president established a, a foundation and appointed some of his uh, closest friends and most trusted advisors to serve on that foundation uh, is so that he wouldn't have to spend so much time thinking about it. Uh, that, that has been the work of uh, the, the board of the foundation, and they have, of course, kept the president updated uh, on their work. Uh, they've kept the first lady updated on their work, too. She's got a say in this. And but I guess my point is he is thinking about it. He's spending a lot more time thinking about well, it. I guess my, talking about I it. I guess my point is that the president is focused on his responsibilities as president of the United States, and I think that he's been very clear with all of you that he's determined to use every single day that he has remaining in office to advance the agenda that he's put forward for the American people. And that's why he would set up a system where he would have people who are focused on his post-presidency life who can start working and planning uh, for that stuff now so that the president himself doesn't have to dedicate nearly as much time or energy or thought uh, to that process. And uh, he'll have ample time post-presidency uh, to think about what those kinds of priorities will be. And what does the selection of the South Side of Chicago say about the legacy <laughs> of his presidency? That well, I, you know, the, the, obviously the South Side of Chicago is where the president got his political start. Uh, and the president spent um, many of his formative years uh, in that community. Uh, and it's where he met his wife. It's where he raised his kids. Uh, but it's also where he got uh, interested in politics uh, and interested in uh, public service and interested in uh, trying to um, work through the government system uh, to benefit um, people all across the country, uh, but also ensure that we're uh, expanding economic opportunity for everybody, and particularly for middle class families and for those who are trying to get into the middle class. Uh, and um, you know, that's, that, I think that's what makes the south side of Chicago an appropriate venue for uh, the future uh, Obama presidential library. And getting back to Putin, is the president trying to test the waters here to see if the, that relationship can be improved? Is that why the secretary met with him? Well, no. What's, what's going on? I, I, don't, I would not describe it that way. I would describe this as you know, part of our uh, regular um, uh, efforts to communicate with uh, the Russian government. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry. He could do that with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. I, this is, uh, how long has it been since a uh, high-level person from this administration has met with uh, I'm not I, would, I would imagine it's been a, a, a while. Uh, it, it probably has been a few months, at least since, it's a, it's since the president's meeting. A significant meeting, it seems to me, was, it would be a, this is a significant meeting. Well, I think any time that you're meeting with the Russian president and it's the Secretary of State who's doing it, then yes, that would be an important meeting. Uh, but it is you know, part and partial of our ongoing effort to communicate uh, with the Russian government on a wide range of issues. Many of those issues will be uh, difficult ones to discuss around the table because we have pretty, uh, we, ha we have significant differences with them. Uh, when it comes to the need of need for Russia to respect the basic territorial uh, integrity uh, of their uh, Ukrainian neighbors. Uh, at the same time, there are other areas where we're able to work more constructively and cooperatively to advance the interests of both our countries. And uh, I'm confident that issues in both categories will get uh, significant attention in uh, today's talks. Maybe I'm beating around the bush too much. I'll get right to it. So okay. the G7 meeting is coming up next month. There's no possibility that Russia could be invited back into the G7, and, and it will become the G8, certainly not within the next month, I would imagine. Uh, that's, uh, at the, that kind of conversation that all happened. Well, at, at this point, I think that's diff very, pretty difficult to imagine. Uh, you know, we've got, we, we've laid out a long list of concerns that we have with uh, Russian behavior. Uh, but Jim, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that we've also been very clear, both in public uh, and in private, with the Russians about what kind of steps they can take to essentially reduce the amount of isolation that they're currently facing. Uh, we've seen that the Russian economy has, uh, has weakened significantly, uh, both because of declining energy prices, but also because of the sanctions that have been put in place by the United States in coordination with their European allies. Uh, and we've been very clear that we'd be prepared uh, to take some steps to relax or even remove those sanctions uh, if Russia started to live up to the commitments that they'd made in the context of the Minsk implementation plan. And uh, there's obviously a lot of work for them to do to live up to those commitments, because thus far, uh, they haven't. Uh, but if there's any mystery 
about what will be required uh, to get uh, for Russia to be able to start to enjoy the benefits of uh, a more normal relationship with countries around the world and with uh, countries in Europe and certainly the United States, um, there shouldn't be, uh, because we've been very clear about uh, what kinds of steps we'd like to see them take. Okay? But I, I guess th my point is I don't envision those uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I don't envision those steps being completed uh, in advance of next month's G7 meeting. So you were talking about, well, Russia and space, and it, mm -hmm. it just sounded somewhat more optimistic than some of the language you've heard that from this administration over the last several months with respect to Russia. And well, I, I, think that, I think that underscores the complexity of our relationship, and it certainly doesn't uh, in any way diminish the very serious concerns that we have with Russia's um, failure to respect uh, the territorial integrity of their Ukrainian neighbors. Okay. Chris. Thanks, Josh. Uh, the organizers of the movement to put a woman on a $20 bill have uh, announced that they have voted, that the public has voted for Harriet Tubman. Um, and a wonderful they've, choice. They've, de they've delivered a petition to the White House formally asking the president uh, to take action on this. Is he even aware of this? Would he direct, for, I guess, would be Secretary Lou to look into it any further? Uh, th this organization has been uh, quite effective at generating media attention, uh, and the president, as an ag avid consumer of the news, uh, I'm confident has at least a general awareness of their efforts. Uh, I don't know if he's aware of the petition that they uh, that they delivered, uh, but uh, you know, for questions about uh, the currency, I'd refer you to the Treasury Department and Secretary Lou. Care to venture a guess on how likely it is we'll see a woman on the 20 by 2020? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. Colleen? Um, going back to trade for a minute, um, beyond the meeting that you referenced with Senator Murray, what else has the White House been doing in these last couple days to make a last push? Um, has the President been making calls? Has Dennis McDonough been making calls? Or at this point, are you just counting on the Senate to resolve this procedural snafu? Uh, there have been a number of calls that have been placed by everyone, by many people at the White House, by many white, senior White House officials up to and including the President. Uh, I don't have any details about those conversations or those uh, phone calls to share with you. I think there were uh, reports that uh, the President had scheduled a meeting yesterday with uh, a small group of Senate Democrats that had to be uh, put off because of the voting schedule on the floor of the United States Senate. Uh, you might call that a scheduling snafu. Um, but these, these, these kinds of things crop up. And I think uh, I mentioned it only to highlight uh, that this gives you a, a pretty good indication of our ongoing efforts to engage uh, members of the United States Senate and to encourage them to support legislation that would give the President the authority that he needs to complete the agreement and the authority that he needs to enforce it. Okay. Leslie. Thanks, Josh. I wanted to go back to the library. Um, the President has said that he will not be involved in raising money for himself, but a lot of good government... Uh, while he's in office. Yeah. Not right. Yeah. Um, but a lot of good government groups have suggested that it still raises the possibility of conflicts of interest um, by having groups that he's very much affiliated with raising money for the library. Does the White House consider this a conflict, and have you done anything to prevent it? Well, I'd refer you to my colleagues at the Foundation who will be steeped in all these details, but I can tell you that there are a number of steps. Uh, that the Foundation is planning to take to ensure that they live up to the high standard that the President established as a candidate for this office. Uh, the Foundation will not accept donations from uh, PACs or lobbyists while the President is in office. Uh, the Foundation will not accept <coughs> donations from foreign governments uh, while the President is in office. Uh, and the, the Foundation in, intends to uh, disclose on a quarterly basis the, the donations that they do receive in excess of 200 or $250 uh, again, to sort of uh, fulfill the, the transparency that the President's talked about quite a bit. And uh, so go ahead. So was that something that was worked out with the White House that, to avoid potential conflicts of interest? Well, I, I, though, though, certainly the Foundation was li interested in living up to the very high standard that the President himself established. Uh, I don't know, frankly, if there are any specific conversations that took place between the White House and the Foundation. Uh, but uh, again, based on the fact that the President had uh, appointed to the foundation, uh, people who are intimately aware of his knowledge uh, and his uh, approach to these issues in the past um, understood that it would be a priority for the foundation uh, to live up to that high standard that the president himself set in the context of his campaign. Okay, Alexis. Just to clarify, uh, just you're saying just to make sure any donor 
who would like to give to the library while the president is serving as president, who would like to give more than $200, has to agree that their donation will be made public. That's my understanding. You should confirm that with the foundation, but that's my understanding of the rules that they've established. Okay. Dave. Thanks, Josh. Uh, at the GCC summit later this week, does the president uh, intend to bring up human rights concerns in, the, in countries that are participating? Mm -hmm. Well, that will not be the focus of the meeting. Uh, obviously, this will be an important opportunity for uh, the United States to deepen, deepen and modernize our security cooperation uh, with our GCC partners. You know, much of the conversation will be focused on uh, what these countries can do to um, better coordinate uh, their own uh, security measures. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about sort of what, uh, what sort of additional assistance will the United States uh, provide. Obviously, there's already a, a significant U.S. military presence in the region. Uh, each of these countries has a significant uh, military to military relationship with the United States when it comes to uh, getting military hardware uh, and security hardware uh, to provide for the security of their country. Uh, the thing that the United States believes would significantly enhance the effectiveness uh, of, the, um, of these countries when providing for their own security is to strengthen their uh, interoperability. Uh, that is to say, what can they do to make sure that the uh, countries are not relying on the United States to make sure that they're coordinating the efforts, but what can they do directly to coordinate their efforts? Let me give you one example. There's uh, been uh, some discussion about how important uh, ballistic missile defense is to the national security of many of these countries. Uh, and many of these countries do have a robust uh, infrastructure when it comes to uh, missile defense. Uh, but of course, ballistic missiles don't respect um, political boundaries, uh, and that the architecture of this missile defense would be greatly enhanced if you had missile defense not just for an individual country, uh, but for the entire region, and that you had these missile defense batteries essentially uh, working in concert uh, to protect all of the countries in the GCC. Uh, and so this is indicative of uh, how important it is for this interoperability uh, to be established and for these individual governments uh, to work together to enhance their security. It isn't, doesn't necessarily reflect a need for additional hardware. Uh, it reflects a, uh, a need for a commitment to pursuing this kind of uh, uh, cooperative relationship with their neighbors. Getting back to the human rights question, many uh, human rights activists are saying today that the, the people who are participating in this meeting with the president from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, are the very people that need to hear from the president about human rights abuses in their countries because they're the ones who are in charge of the state security apparatuses. Mm -hmm. Um, and these human rights activists are questioning whether the president is quote unquote tough enough to raise those kind of concerns with these people. <laughs> Do you have a response to that? Well, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, well, again, I'll, let me just reiterate that the meetings will be focused on regional security cooperation. Uh, but the president and members of his team will, as they do in every meeting, uh, stress the need for long term solutions that build more inclusive governance and service delivery in conflict ridden societies promote reconciliation, protect all minorities, and respect uh, universal human rights, including uh, freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly. Uh, this, is a, this is a priority for the United States, both when it comes to uh, our values and our priorities. But what we also know is that respect for basic universal human rights uh, has an impact on broader uh, long-term regional stability, uh, and that if we Advancing these goals uh, will benefit the United States and we know will enhance the prospects for long-term regional stability uh, among these uh, partners of ours. Okay. Uh, John. Thank you, Josh. Two questions. First, uh, Greece today made its payment back to the IMF of uh, its latest portion of the loan that it had. Now, there's been some concern that it might not be able to do so the next time it's up. The President, we know, has talked to Chancellor Merkel about this. Is he in regular consultation with her and Prime Minister Tsipras on the Greek loan repayment? Uh, the President is not, uh, but the Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew, uh, has been engaged with his counterparts and with some European leaders uh, on this issue with some regularity. Uh, this is the way that um, the United States facilitated previous rounds of this um, 
of these financial difficulties. Uh, we're obviously aware of the significant economic consequences and financial consequences uh, for Greece being able to meet its obligations and continue to be uh, a part of the currency union in Europe. Uh, and that's why you've seen uh, Secretary Liu uh, been actively, be actively engaged, uh, both with his counterparts but also with some uh, European leaders, including Prime Minister Cyprus, uh, when it comes to uh, trying to facilitate uh, these kinds of um, solutions. But ultimately, you know, what we have said is the United States is prepared to support Europe as they confront these challenges. But ultimately, it's going to be the responsibility of Greece uh, and the EU uh, and the other multilateral institutions that are involved uh, to resolving uh, these difficulties. Turning to the home front in Congress, a question about TPP. Uh, two weeks ago, Chairman Paul Ryan of the House Ways and Means Committee insisted that uh, the uh, agreement contains nothing dealing with immigration, and later Chairman Goodlatte of the Judiciary Committee put out a statement praising uh, USTR Froman for not including immigration. Now, Senator Sessions and some other lawmakers have said it does indeed include portions of the comprehensive immigration package in a trade deal. Who's right on this? Can the White House say? Well, if, uh, I, I think I would trust the word of Ambassador Froman. Uh, he obviously has the principal responsibility for negotiating this agreement, and I know that this is a discussion that he's had with uh, members of Congress quite frequently. Uh, and we believe that the way to ultimately resolve uh, our broken immigration system is to pass legislation that would finally bring some accountability to our broken immigration system. Uh, and we believe that's something that Congress uh, should do, and we've made that case uh, for a long time. Uh, but I do not envision that being uh, coupled together with this other economic priority, which is uh, the passage of TPA legislation that would give the President the authority that he needs to complete a uh, TPP agreement and the authority that he needs to enforce it. So you're saying that Chairman Ryan and Chairman Goodlack are correct when they said it, TPP has nothing uh, to do with immigration? And I think they said that based on their own conversations with Ambassador Froman. Uh, and considering that he is the principal negotiator here, I think he's a, an awfully good source. There's probably not a better one. Okay. Cheryl. Um, the President, in his comments this morning on, on poverty, said it would take some money to uh, invest in early childhood education and worker training and in infrastructure jobs. Um, but the bills coming out of Congress right now, the spending bills, are s still keep sequestration. What progress have you made in trying to come to agreement on spending this year? Yeah, not much. Uh, we uh, we've obviously raised you know some significant concerns about some of the appropriations bills that are working their way through the committee process. Uh, just yesterday, the, uh, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, Sean Donovan, uh, sent a letter to uh, members of the uh, Transportation and Housing uh, Appropriations Subcommittee uh, to raise some significant concerns with the legislation that um, they were working on. Uh, the early draft of that legislation includes a billion-dollar cut in our infrastructure investments. Uh, it reflects a significant cut in the Choice Neighborhoods Program. Uh, that would significantly underfund that important priority, particularly when we're talking about issues of expanding opportunity, uh, economic opportunity for everybody in this country. So we have some pretty significant concerns about the current status of uh, those uh, appropriations efforts. Uh, but there's still uh, ample time uh, for Democrats and Republicans to do what uh, Paul Ryan and Patty Murray did a couple years ago, which is to sit down together in bipartisan fashion and figure out a way that uh, Congress can go beyond the uh, sequester caps that n hardly anybody supports. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're hopeful that they'll be able to do. And if we see that Democrats and Republicans are able to work together in that effort, they'll have the, the full support of the White House uh, as they try to find that bipartisan common ground. Uh, we believe that'd be good for the political process, but most importantly, uh, it'd be good for our economy to avoid a government shutdown and to make sure that our priorities, both when it comes to defense, uh, but also to our economy, are properly recognized. Okay. Kevin. Josh, thanks. I want to take you back to uh, September 2012. Uh, ben Rhodes's uh, now infamous uh, memo. Uh, I think it's infamous in for some of the way that's been covered in the media. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> that's the reason it's infamous. But go ahead. Indeed, yeah. Uh, at the time, uh, he said it was not explicitly about Benghazi. And I want to read to you something that Jay Carney said, your predecessor, uh, in April 2014, when referring 
to that memo. He said, uh, in fact, this was not, it was explicitly not about Benghazi. It was about the overall situation in the region, the Muslim world, where you saw protests outside of embassy facilities across the region, including Cairo, Sana'a, Khartoum, and Tunis. Yesterday, uh, former CIA Deputy Director Mike Morrell said that uh, Jay misled reporters in the public when he suggested that this was a, a broad sweep of protests in the region and not specifically about Benghazi. What's your reaction to that? Uh, my reaction is that Mr. Morrell uh, makes clear uh, that the talking points surrounding the Benghazi attack were not politicized. Uh, in fact, what he wrote is there is no such conspiracy, as I have already explained, and there is no evidence to support such a theory. No committee of Congress that has studied Benghazi has come to this conclusion. Uh, he went so far as to call Benghazi the, quote, poster child of the intrusion of politics into national security. He went on to say, I believe Benghazi is an example of what is wrong with American politics, politicians focused on scoring political points rather than working together to advance the interests of our country. And with uh, that, I would wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Morrell. And yesterday he said Jay misled the public and reporters in suggesting that that memo was not politicized. Is he lying then or is he lying now? Well, again, I, I think that the point that Mr. Morrell makes in his book is the relevant one, which is that it is false to suggest uh, that this thing has been uh, politicized, this tragedy has been politicized uh, by the administration. I think, unfortunately, we have seen uh, some, again, as Mr. Morrell says, some who have sought to rather cynically try to score political points by politicizing what is a legitimate tragedy. Uh, and that's unfortunate. So why would McDonough then send Morrell with Rice to the Hill, for example, whose talking points, it seems pretty evident, clearly mirrored the memo from Rhodes rather than the CIA's assessment? Well, what's clear is that this administration, as we have throughout this whole uh, saga of supposed congressional oversight, uh, is to provide members of Congress with, most, with the most direct, specific, granular knowledge possible. Uh, and one way to make sure that members of Congress had good insight into what the intelligence community was thinking was to send the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency up to Capitol Hill to explain it to him. Lastly, on much lighter note, on Brady. Yes. Four games, million bucks, a couple of draft picks, yeah. appropriate. Uh, that's a decision for the uh, NFL to make. And, uh, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I've got lots of thoughts, but um, none I'm willing to share here. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Chris. Josh, today the Food and Drug Administration issued draft guidance that would eliminate the lifetime ban prohibiting gay bisexual men from donating blood and replace it with a policy requiring one year of abstinence before they can donate. Does the president think this is good final policy, or should the FDA move on to eliminate the ban altogether? It's my understanding, uh, based on what I've heard about this, that the, FE, uh, the FDA has not uh, rendered a final judgment on this. This is the subject of ongoing consideration both by scientists but also by the public health professionals uh, at the FDA that have a responsibility for ensuring that the American people and our blood supply is safe. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we're, we're going to be guided by the science uh, when it comes to this. The President has said before that uh, he opposes discrimination. Wouldn't that, why wouldn't that naturally apply to the issue of uh, donation, blood donation from gay and bisexual men? Well, because uh, again, this will be something that's going to be guided by the science. And the President does have a very strong record when it comes to uh, ensuring that we're not discriminated, di discriminating against people because of who they love. Uh, and the President feels strongly about that, um, about that principle being abided by. Uh, he also feels strongly about making sure that we have uh, you know, an effective system uh, that manages uh, the reserve blood supply of the country. And uh, we're mindful of that, and that's why you know, we've got some of the best scientists in the world at the FDA that are looking at this issue uh, and making sure that we can um, reach an agreement or reach a policy uh, that is in the best interest of the country. One more thing. The Texas House of Representatives is scheduled to vote today on a bill that uh, would apparently seek to defy a Supreme Court ruling in favor of same-sex marriage by prohibiting the use of local and state funds to issue a marriage license to a same-sex couple. Is the President aware of this legislation, and does he oppose it? Uh, I've only seen uh, some news coverage of this. Uh, the, uh, I refrain from putting myself on the hook for every piece of legislation that is considered by uh, a state legislature. Uh, but obviously, this is uh, among the things that the Supreme Court uh, is considering now and will ultimately have a, a decision on, hopefully, later this summer. 
sound like bad legislation to you? Based on what uh, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't draw any conclusions based on the way that it sounds at this point. But I think the president's values when it comes to this question are are very clear and well well articulated. Thanks, Jordan. Josh. Thanks, Josh. Um, Leader McConnell and Senator Hatch are saying that Senator Wyden backtracked on a commitment uh, for a deal that would bring TPA and TAA to the floor only. Is that the White House's understanding as well? And does the White House still view Senator Wyden as a reliable partner on the trade issue? Uh, Jordan, what we saw in the Senate Finance Committee was uh, the chairman, Senator Hatch, working closely with the ranking member, Senator Wyden, to put together a a trade proposal that ensures the President has the authority that he needs to complete a TPP agreement uh, and the authority that he needs to enforce it. And we were pleased to see that they were able to work in bipartisan fashion together to put together this bipartisan compromise. Then what they did was they worked with members of their committee uh, to, to craft an agreement that attracted the, major the support of the majority of Republicans uh, and the majority of Democrats. Uh, and that is effective bipartisan work at the committee level in the United States Senate. And we're hopeful that that kind of spirit and that kind of focus on the content uh, of legislation that does stand to benefit the American economy uh, will prevail as, this, uh, as the Senate works its way through this procedural snafu. And one more on Israel. Uh, the White House said after the elections that it would conduct a reassessment of the U.S.'s diplomatic relationship with Israel. Now that the government has been formed, is there an update on that reassessment? Have you guys made any decisions on how you're going to move forward? Well, I, I um, let me quibble with one aspect of your question, which is I don't think that there is a, a consider, reconsideration of our uh, diplomatic relationship with Israel. The relationship between the United States and Israel uh, is strong, uh, and it is focused primarily on the critically important security cooperation between our two countries. Uh, that security relationship is critical to uh, the very existence of Israel and critical to their national security, but it also has important benefits for the American people and for American national security. Uh, we did, uh, and the President did indicate, uh, that, the, um, that the Prime Minister's comments about the pursuit of a two-state solution uh, necessarily prompted a reconsideration of our approach to trying to resolve uh, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, but that in no way inhibited our ability to, um, uh, to communicate with the Israelis, particularly when it comes to our uh, security cooperation. Uh, and you know, the United States has continued to take a variety of steps, even in uh, a range of multilateral fora, uh, to stand up diplomatically uh, for Israel, uh, even in situations that um, you know, left the United States feeling a little isolated. Uh, but that underscores the depth of not just the President's commitment to our relationship with Israel, uh, but it reflects the depth of the relationship between our two countries, one that has persisted uh, across, um, across generations, uh, and one that has persisted even uh, as the leaders of the two countries have um, uh, been representing different political parties. Uh, and that kind of bipartisan commitment to Israel uh, is a hallmark of that relationship and reflects uh, the deep ties between our two countries that uh, endure to this day. Expect any announcements or changes to be made? Uh, no. I, well, I, again, I wouldn't expect any broad announcements. Uh, but you know, the the uh, the approach that we take to trying to facilitate a resolution of the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians uh, is necessarily different because of the uh, comments made by the Prime Minister in the closing days of his election. Okay. Thanks. Sharish, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Uh, what is the what is objectionable about having the currency language in the TPA bill? Uh, the concern that we have uh, expressed about some of the currency language that's included uh, is uh, is twofold. Uh, the first is that the um, United States uh, pursuing regular sort of uh, diplomatic economic negotiations uh, has been effective uh, in addressing some of the currency practices of other countries that have put the United States uh, at, a, uh, at a disadvantage. So again, a couple of examples that I've cited a couple of times that uh, since 2010, China's exchange rate is up nearly 30 percent on a real effective basis. And that's because when uh, U.S. officials are meeting with China in the context of the G20 and uh, in the context of the IMF, that there's an opportunity for us to 
relay our concerns uh, on this issue. Uh, and that diplomacy has been effective uh, in, in leveling the playing field, or at least beginning to level the playing field uh, for American businesses who are competing uh, against Chinese enterprises that may uh, benefit from a devalued currency. Uh, a similar, we've seen a similar phenomenon in Japan, uh, that over the last three years, uh, Japan has not intervened in the foreign exchange market. Uh, there are significant concerns by U.S. manufacturers, uh, including some in the auto industry, uh, about uh, Japanese interventions. And we haven't seen that over the last three years. And again, that's because of the advocacy of U.S. officials. Uh, so the point is, we do have mechanisms in place that will allow us to advance the interests of the U.S. economy uh, when it comes to currency policy. The other concern that we have is that the proposal, one of the proposals that's currently being considered by the Congress would, or at least could potentially, undermine the independence of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and it could make it easier for other countries uh, to try to encroach on the ability of the Federal Reserve to make independent decisions about what they believe is in the best interest of the U.S. economy. Uh, and the President doesn't believe that's good for the economy at all uh, in this country. It certainly is not good for American businesses and American workers. So the point is, we believe that we have uh, a variety of effective mechanisms already uh, that allow the administration, as we've effectively done when it comes to China, China and Japan, uh, to protect the interests of the United States and our economy uh, when it comes to currency policy. That is the White House suggesting, lobbying, Minority Leader Reid to drop the idea of rolling all four together? Well, uh, we have made clear what our views are, uh, both on this specific currency topic uh, and more broadly, uh, about the need for legislation that would give the President the authority that he needs to complete the agreement and to enforce it. Uh, and that's the guidance that we have shared with, um, you know, in all of the conversations that we've had with members of Congress. Uh, and, you know, what we're counting on uh, is that Democrats and Republicans in the United States Senate uh, will be, work, be able to work together in the same way that Demo Democrats and Republicans on the Senate Finance Committee did uh, to find uh, bipartisan common ground uh, and pass legislation that the President believes is critically important to uh, our long-term economic success right here in the United States. All right. Thanks, everybody.